What is up, Bruins fans? Today I'm bringing you a clip for episode 359 of the Black Mold Hockey Podcast, where host Sam Smith, Mark Allred, Dom Tiano, and myself discuss Bruins free agency. Absolutely. Well, uh, second su- su- subject of discussion, if I could say it properly. Uh, let's talk about some free agency acquisitions the Bruins had, and they had a lot of them uh, on Monday. Uh, of course, the first big one that they had was Elias Lindholm. <laughs> Seven-year deal. a season for Elias Lindholm. Uh, They needed a number one center, and they got it. They got it in Elias Lindholm, who is going to be in that number one center role with presumably Zaka and David Pasternak as his wings. So what are our thoughts about Elias Lindholm being signed by the Bruins right at 12 o'clock as free agency struck? I think... You can put the Zadorov uh, signing in with this. Is they had a goal uh, to to get a centerman and get a defenseman, and um, you know, let's put Steven Stamkos on the wing and say that the Bruins went out and got the best available centerman and one of the best available defensemen, all in one swoop. So um, I know there are people knocking the term, knocking the dollars. You you were going to have to pay to get it. You know, um, there there's no way around it. You were going to have to pay. <coughs> um, I will say this. Well, no, I'll let the other two guys talk about Lindholm when we get to the Zadorov. Then I'll add something. Uh, I thought it was a good signing uh, and and talking or well, not talking, but listening to uh, Don Sweeney in his press conference, um, mentioning that this was a two year process. So the, the Boston Bruins were invested in trying to get this guy for at least two years. So the rumors we've all heard have been true for the past two years that the Bruins were looking at this guy. Um, and there's a door off. I thought it was, an okay deal. I wasn't too thrilled about the the term that he got, but it identifies a certain nastiness on the back end that this Boston Bruins team seems to be lacking just a little bit. Uh, is is this the the defensive move that's going to catapult, or you know, a Stanley Cup remains to be seen. But he does play that type of hockey that Boston Bruins fans are clamoring for every year in the postseason about getting nastier and and bigger and so on well they identified it right here with this signing so um i i like it i i like it a lot and um you know he's gonna be older it's probably not gonna the contract is probably not gonna look great later on but still you know you still needed that number one center um because it's not coming internally we don't have that guy right now so this was the next best move that this team needed to make happen yeah, and I agree with that too. And you think about a guy like Lindholm, right? He might not be your flashy star player, but what he does do is make his teammates around him better, especially when he's playing with good players. So think about who's going to be on his line next year. You got two guys, right? You got Pasternak and Zach, both players who play very similarly to Lindholm, but Pasternak is going to be able to score. Zaka is going to be able to pass the puck and get that puck over to Pasternak to score. And Lindholm is going to be the finisher of the three as well, right? That's going to be the trick this year is to see how well Lindholm can play alongside those two. But I think in general, the trick to Lindholm is going to be the chemistry within the line is one thing, but at the same time, is he going to be able to find his groove? Because we've seen it. When he plays with good players, his level of play elevates, and we'll see if that happens with the Bruins this year. I'll I'll say this about the signing. Like a lot of people are complaining because they didn't replace Jake DeBrus offense. Well, they did. They more than replaced it with Elias Lindholm. Okay. Lindholm is going to put up more points than Jake DeBrusque put up last year. Not only did they improve the center position, they improved the left wing position because now you can move Pavel Zaka to left wing. So you've automatically improved that position as well. You've automatically improved the face-offs. You now got a great guy in the bumper on the power play 
which should improve the power play. And yeah. I, I mean, it just slots everybody so perfectly um, to to where they belong. With with the door off, I will say this. Without naming a name, the Bruins had an agreement with one of their own free agents. There was a contract on the table on July 1st in the morning when they knew for certainty that they were getting Nikita Zadorov, they pulled the contract. That's how much they thought of Zadorov. And they needed to, you, you look, Matt Grizzlick is out. Derek Forbert is out. Nikita Zadorov is in. Uh, Parker Watherspoon now becomes your number seven defenseman. You tell me that defense is not better than it was last year. That defense oh, is going to be – people are saying this, and I completely agree. The Bruins' defense is scary next year because you have Zadorov <laughs> presumably playing with McAvoy or Carlo, one of the two. I don't think Zadorov's playing third defensive pairing minutes with Peak. I just don't see that. Um, I, I see him in the top four. You have uh, – on the left side, you have Zadorov, Lorai, and Lindholm. That three in itself will be fine. And then your right side, right? You have McAvoy, who's going to have a bounce back here after a struggling last year. You have Andrew Peake and Brandon Carlo, and all of that's going to work. And if all fails, you have Parker Watherspoon slotting in if somebody needs to have a night off or somebody gets injured. You have Watherspoon there who can play both sides and does it well. Um, mm -hmm. Back to Elias Lindholm. Uh Again, they needed a center, right? They were lacking. I don't think Zaka at the dot was good enough to be a top center in the for the Bruins, which is why they went out and got a center. Um, Elias Lindholm, I think, is going to work well with Pasternak. I think those two are going to create magic over the next few years, and it's going to be a great thing um, for both parties. And I think Zaka will get involved in that as well. So I think overall, this is going to this is these are two really good signings. Um, next signing here, this is the final like NHL level signing the Bruins made. And this is still a really good signing in my opinion. And I didn't see it coming. Max Jones, two year deal, 1 million a season. This is a good signing for depth purposes. And it's also a good signing for your, for your fourth line. I think, right. Max Jones coming in from Anaheim was doing well in Anaheim, will come in and, and will only improve the Bruins' bottom six. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another player that um, brings it, plays on the edge, um, you know, he's got NHL games and so on. I, I think it was a solid depth. Um, I, I don't think this is a the type of player that's probably going to end up in Providence after going through waivers. But, um, I mean, we'll see what happens. But I, I like the way that this guy plays uh, because he does – he does bring that element that I believe the Bruins have been missing. And and another one, another player that the Bruins really looked at uh, to identify that hole. And I think they did a good job with this one. I watched him a lot with the London Knights. And Parker could probably uh, uh, agree with this. When he was playing junior and I watched him play, I'd say to myself, what an asshole. <laughs> you know, what an asshole, but I'm glad he's on my team. Um, I think he has third line capabilities in him. Um, you know, whether the Bruins can get it out of him or not, we'll see. But I, I, I think he can provide some offense. And I, I'll tell you what, you know, with him and Kostelik, and and Zadorov, nobody's taking liberties with the Boston Bruins anymore. Nobody. Right. Nope. They got bigger and badder real quick. Yeah. And, like we'll get to Jacob Lauko next. Like, you know, you you asked me a hundred times who would I prefer on my team, Max Jones or Jacob Lauko. I'm picking Max Jones a hundred times. Every time. Makes two. Every single time. 
Yeah, and and the other thing I think a lot of people forget too is this guy was a is a former first round pick, yeah. right? Yeah. He, yes. And and he's shown at times, admittedly not recently, but at times the ability to play to the level of what that first round pick once was. But I think this is still a guy who's going to be playing third and fourth line minutes for you, but he's going to be a solid defensive role player first. The offense will come, you know, you'll put him alongside, in my opinion, Frederick and Patra, those two guys between the and Max Jones, that's going to be sort of have Patra playing a little bit of a smaller, more skillful, skillful role alongside guys like Jones and Frederick will be playing a little bit more physical. That could be a line that really works. I think mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it'll come down to chemistry to see who kind of finds it, how, finds it best. But that third and fourth line is going to be dangerous this year, physically and skillfully. Now, wasn't Jones and one of the other signings back-to-back picks in the same same draft? Yeah, I just don't remember the name. We'll get to it. Uh, uh, was it was it Tuft? Tuft, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about tough. him in a minute. Actually, yeah, b- before we get to that, I want to point out something. So people have been asking about this. So people have been saying, oh, well – they're, they're going to call up LaSalle and put him in the top six right away, right? Very delusionally. I, I I was saying this. If they don't have a second line right wing by opening night, here's what you do, my opinion. You slide Morgan Geeky up to the second line right wing. You stick him with Coyle and Marshawn. They proved last year, whenever they played together, that the three of them work. You, I like your idea of Patra with Jones and Frederick. I think that's a good trio. Frederick can play the right side well. Jones plays the left side. Patrick can protect in the middle. And then the fourth line, you can go Castellic, Beecher, Brazo. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? There's there's so many possibilities there. But I, I can tell you Fabian Lysel is going to give be given every opportunity to earn a spot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm not saying he won't make the roster. He just won't make second line minutes right out of right out of preseason. I don't think so. Right. Well, that's that's where he needs to be. Uh, he can't be on the fourth yeah. line and so on. He's got to be put in the best position possible with, uh, and surrounded by players that are going to make him better offensively. If if they don't do that, just leave him in Providence for another year. What was Matt Patra given as a 19-year-old last season? Third line minutes. No, he moved down later. He was on the th- right. second line to start. I, to, to be honest, I think we're at the point now, right, where in many ways it's starting to become do or die time for guys like Lysel and Merkulov. Yeah. I mean, we're starting to get to the end of the line in terms of contracts. Are they going to return if they haven't even really been given a shot in the NHL level? Sure, they've been given shots, but the truth is, right, it's the third and fourth line where they don't play the way that they've been playing. you got to give them a shot at some point. And that's what Sweeney was talking about in that in that interview that I'm sure I think a lot of people have seen to this point was – we're going to give our guys a shot to make it. And sort of to our point about our talk earlier regarding that third and fourth line, now you throw in a guy like Kiki as well, right? Where is he going to slot into that lineup? If you take him off that second line right wing or first line right wing, depending on if you're putting Coil out there first or Lindholm, right? That becomes the question. And I think if you put a guy like Merkulov or Lysel, those are the two guys, in my opinion, that are fighting for that second line role, just the way that they play. Actually, I think uh, uh, I'll disagree with you on one part, Parker, and that's Merkulov will be battling Matt Potra for third line center. Yeah, that's that, that's yeah. fair too. Because right? he's barely ever played the wing. Uh, Lysel is a natural winger. So I think that's where the battle is. is Lysel will battle for that. Two right wing, Merkulov will battle Patra for three third line center. Sure. And, and, but I, I think the other part there, right, is just <laughs> then it becomes the question, Dom, of if you're going to be fighting for that spot and you lose, right, say Patra gets really hot in camp, then all of a sudden where does Merkulov go? And that's where I think there's the potential for him to get at least some opportunity. I'm not saying it's set in stone of who it is, but I, right. I don't, my personal opinion, I don't believe that. Lysel has the job out of camp. I don't think Geeky has the job out of camp. I think Merkulov could be a guy that gets a couple opportunities on that second line spot. I, I, then it becomes if he fits the role or not. And to your point, he's not a natural right winger. So does that come into play as well? Might be a question to be answered in camp. Yeah. 
But we said the same thing about Jake DeBrusque when he moved to the right side a couple of years ago when he was slotted with Marshawn and Bergeron. <laughs> Look at how well that worked out for him and his career. Rejuvenated his right. career, I think. It, he yeah, was this- put with he was put with Marshawn for the past three years, who has only helped his game grow. And for, the, for two of those three years, he had Bergeron to guide him as well. It only helped him out. Yeah, but Sam, the difference is you're talking a left winger moving to right wing. Right. In, I know. in, in Jake DeBrusque, as opposed to a natural center who's never played wing before moving to wing at the NHL level. It, it, big difference. No, I know. Well, to, to hop in there, I think the other question then becomes you got to give him the opportunity. Whether he plays well or not, that becomes the problem, Dom, to your mm-hmm. point. Of he's never played there, but at the end of the day, the trick becomes at some point you got to give him an option somewhere in the lineup, whether that's on the third line center role where you're looking at a guy like Potter to really take the next step this year, or on the second line right winger where it's already up for grabs and really could be anyone in that lineup. I think that's where the question becomes out of camp to see if they give him the the, the opportunity to try and claim that role. And 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 to, just to jump in a little bit here too, um, concerning um, Lysel and Merkulov. I mean, this is a big year. We've been talking about it for the last couple of minutes about them. But there's another thing that needs to be considered too: is the more this goes on and on, the more their value drops. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Well, uh, we get to our next topic of discussion, and that's. Some of the AHL signings they had, and they had a bunch of them. Riley Tuft, Cole Kepka, Jordan Osterley, Billy Sweezy, Jeff VL. Osterley is probably the only one who probably has the most NHL experience out of the bunch. I would possibly put him over Ian Mitchell in the defensive depth chart because of the experience factor alone. Although his Mitchell has a little bit more skill than Osterly, but what are your guys' thoughts on these signings? Quickly before somebody else goes, I do want to mention that these are NHL signings, um, Sam. So these guys will will participate in camp, fight for yep. a job, and then if they don't make it, then they will, you know, be put on waivers to go to Providence. Um, so just want to let you know because there's a difference between uh, an NHL contract and an AHL contract. Well, yeah, you no. won't see you won't see 775K on an AHL contract. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I I think Osterley, the reason he was signed is they don't have much depth on the blue line in Providence. They got some really, really raw defensemen. You know, Brunet's still raw. Uh, Jackson Edwards still raw. I think Callahan's the most experienced if I'm, <coughs> or maybe Ian Mitchell. But the thing with Osterley, he's got, what, 350 NHL games under his belt. Uh, he's there for that depth the, and that leadership and to teach uh, those young guys in Providence. I really believe that's what they, they signed him for. Yeah, and I completely agree with you there. And I'm going to play a game here. I'm going to take uh, 12 words to describe these signings. Tuft, big. Kepke, big. Osterly, leadership, and big. Sweezy, big. BL, big. Right? That's what you're looking at for these guys. They're big players who play physical games with the exception of one or two, but they still have the size, and that's what this Bruins free agency is and draft have been all about, right? It's been all about the physicality and that's what they've brought to this, this table. And, you know, whether it's in their NHL signings that are going to fight out of camp or if it's the guys they traded for, everyone here is just big. And that's <laughs> the new reputation of the Boston Bruins is that they're going to be a tough team to play against. And we've seen it this year, especially with these bigger teams, how they f- just find ways, especially in the playoffs to move it ahead some of these guys might become big, big factors for the Bruins as they head down the stretch, especially with injuries. And also, if they make it through the waiver process and go to Providence, what a big help for that team down there. Um, you won't be running prospects with these guys if they all make it through. 
Um, Fabian Lysol will not get run over and get another concussion. I guarantee that. Um, Daniel Flynn says something about uh, does Providence look better than last season? As of right now, if all these guys can make it through the waiver process without getting claimed, I believe they do. I believe they identified uh, areas at both levels, the American Hockey League and the National Hockey League, when it comes to bigger physical uh, players to, you know, um, wear down on other teams, but also be that be veteran players that are also going to stick up for one another down in the A. So I have a friend who, uh, who is a Jets fan. Um, you guys may know him, uh, Nolan Hockey Podcast. He's a, a big Winnipeg Jets fan, and he texted me when it was announced that the Bruins signed VL. He goes, hey, just so you know, you don't ever have to worry about somebody not stepping up for somebody down in Providence. This guy is going to step up big time. And on top of that, he what was it? He there were Manitoba was playing the Calgary Wranglers, and they he, he went at it with a guy, and it was like a thirty second fight because somebody got hit from behind. So we're not gonna ex, we're not gonna have to worry about a Lasalle or a Merkulov or a Brunei or somebody like that to get absolutely smoked and not have any repercussions for it. Which is what the Bruin, which is what Providence and Boston needs. Mm-hmm. So that's a good thing. Um, so there's that. Um, Next topic of discussion, some of the departures that we had in free agency, some Bruins ending up in different spots. Um, Matt Grizzlick, one-year deal with Pittsburgh, 2.75. Derek Forbert going to Vancouver, one-year, 1.5. Jesper Bolquist on his way to Florida, one-year league minimum. Jake DeBrusque, a seven-year deal in in Vancouver, five and a half, and a Danton Heinen in two years, two point two five million, and a notably not on this graphic, Pat Maroon also ending up in Chicago, a one-year, one point three million dollar deal. So a bunch of departures there. Uh, what are our thoughts on these players ending up in all these spots? Let's start with Matt Grizzlick. What? Why Pittsburgh? Why do you think that might be a good fit for Grizzlick? It might be that's the only offer he got. Yeah, yeah, that's what I uh, think too. Look, uh, first of all, I got to say about the last two on the list in DeBrusque and Heinen, they also got no trade clauses. Right. <laughs> I I'm just going to combine all of them together because my thoughts are the same. Take these guys out, put in who Boston brought in, and it's a much better hockey club. All around, top to bottom. Completely agree. Um, you know, we we can discuss. I mean, I already touched on DeBrusque. Uh, the big argument is, is who's going to replace his production? Well, the answer is uh, Elias Lindholm. Simple as that. You're, you're going to see more goals from David Pasternak than we saw last year. You'll possibly see more from Zaka. Frederick should improve. Geeky should improve. The whole blue line should be able to give you at least a dozen goals more than they gave you last season. So I'm not worried about the offense. Not at all. Um, <laughs> for me, yeah, I just want to like address all of them together. Like Grizzly, it, it, it was just time to move on. Fulbert, the same. Bolquist uh, did okay last year as a death player. Um, DeBrusque moving obviously addresses the the forever rumor that he w- would like to get to Western Canada, be a little closer to home. Um, kind of weird, and I know this has been re- regurgitated throughout the uh, the news lately, but it's kind of weird that he, him and Cassidy had such a kind of a, a, a sour relationship, but he's going to play for Rick Tockett now. So we'll see how that works out. Um uh, and Danton Heinen, also another one that gets to go home, gets to play closer to, to where he's from. <laughs> um, and, and you know, he's a versatile player, along with DeBrusque as well. But uh, Heinen's a real good, versatile player. I think he can play anywhere up in that uh, Vancouver Canucks lineup. So good luck to him. I, I, I would love, I would have loved to keep him, but with uh, everything that was going on, I, we were just, the Bruins are basically just saving pennies at this point 
uh, just to try to maximize uh, what they could do uh, and stay at a decent number for another um, signing that still needs to be done. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah. I want to, I, w- I want to say this before we give the floor to Parker about Jake DeBrus because I've listened to about a dozen different podcasts over the last few days about the Cassidy DeBrusque stuff and <laughs> how um, DeBrusque's career was rejuvenated after Montgomery put uh, DeBrusque with, uh, with Marshan and Bergeron. It wasn't Jim Montgomery that did that. It was Bruce Cassidy that did that the season before. Mm-hmm. So shame on you people who do those podcasts. You know who you are. Some of you are professionals. Uh-huh. Um, but <laughs> let's, let's let's keep the facts straight. Parker? Well, uh, we'll bring <laughs> it back to the first point I think I talked about in this entire video. And that's all, or this podcast rather now. But we talked about it, right? Size, 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 size. Matt Grizzlick, small. Oakvist plays a fairly small game. Quick, speedy, great, but, you know, small, right? He plays a smaller game. DeBrusque, very similarly, plays a smaller game. Heinen, for the most part, he gets physical at times, but, you know, he's one of those players that likes to speed around the outside. And then Forbert, who just has had, had, had a little bit of trouble keeping up with the pace of play at times. Sure, you know, he's still a great defender, especially on that PK. You know, he gets into lanes, it sticks big enough to get out there. But, you know, for the Bruins, they're trying to change their identity this season. And you can see it with all the moves they've made to this point. You know, another one we talked about was Maroon. Would have been nice to keep him around, maybe. But then the question becomes, where are you going to put him, right? You're going to put him alongside guys who are slower as well on that fourth line. Might be a tough, tough sell there. But I do think that this, although you might be losing a whole bunch of guys, in my personal opinion, I would take the trade for Lindholm and Zadorov any day over Forbert, DeBrusque, and Heinen. And to, just to add to that, you look at the moves in Providence, and Parker nailed it because it's the exact same in, in Providence. It's it's a it's a uh, organization wide change, and yeah. that is the new Boston Bruins. It's the new Providence Bruins. It's the new team, right? And that's the trick to this to this season, especially. Yeah. Uh, one more guy that's on the graphic. We'll still talk about him, uh, even though he wasn't here for a while. For a while, he was here for a short bit. Pat Maroon signing a one year deal in Chicago. Uh, what are your thoughts on Maroon signing with the Blackhawks, and will this be a big loss? No, no. they got Not Kostelik. They got Kostelik in there that could probably bring more than Pat Maroon could at this point in Maroon's and, career. And he's faster. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So Maroon goes to Chicago. Uh, other notable former Bruins signing with the Blackhawks, Tyler Bertuzzi, Craig Smith. They already have Taylor Hall there. Uh, somebody made the joke in my stream on Monday that they're turning into the Bruins of the Midwest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They got a lot of former Bruins out there, and it's it's turning very interesting. Well, uh, they can they can have the ones that they've got. Like what you saw? Be sure to come back next week for episode 360 of the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast, where hosts Sam Smith, Mark Allred, and Dom Tiano discuss the latest rumors and updates on Bruins free agency and the world of Boston Bruins. See you then.